Hi everyone. Oh well, that's quite hard. Um, I hope everyone is still awake. Last talk of the day. Uh, I'm going to try to keep you awake, so yeah, bear with me. Um, all right, so my name is Ro Roman Piel. I'm working for Songkick. Um, I'm based in London. Um, so Songkick is a um, startup that um, sells tickets for concerts. We have recommendations based on uh, what artists you like and where you live. And uh, yeah, basically we have an Android client, an iOS client, and a web client. Um, we just reward the Android clients, so this talk is going to be heavily inspired on that. Um, so we have the occasion to just basically uh, start, a f start a fresh architecture on, on, um, on an, an Android code base, which is quite ideal. Um, so yeah, basically, yeah, today I want to talk about architecture. Um, I know that we have a lot of blog posts around that. Um, there, is, there are a lot of uh, talks about what to do, what not to do. Google is not taking any position on that. Like developers are just like uh, discussing on their own. Uh, but I, have, I haven't seen a lot of um, actual talks around that, so that's why I'm calling that today. Um, so yeah, let's give it a go. So let, let's start with a story. I'm sure that you know that story. You heard about it before. I've experienced it before as well. Uh, it's a story of a startup that doesn't know anything about Android. So let's take that guy who is called John. Uh, he's got no knowledge in, in, an, in Android dev. He, he's just given that project. OK, John, let's just, let's just build an Android app. We need, we need Android users, so let's just build something. So John says, OK, let's build an Android app. Um, so he's going to start with something like really simple, like because he just needs to show data on the screen. So he's just going to start with a simple activity, and his activity is going to talk to an API manager. I'm sure you're familiar with an API manager. Um, and the API manager will communicate with the API. It's going to get data and returns to the activity, and everything goes smoothly. Um, but then it's going to start uh, having a second screen, same implementation, everything goes right, and then he's starting to wonder, like, well, my API manager is repeated basically in both activities, so why not putting it in an application? So I've got my application, that's pretty convenient. I found out that every activity has, a, has an application, that's pretty cool. Uh, I can just have a single ton, and my activity can just access that via my application. Um, and then at some point, he's like, actually, I need persistency now, but I only need that on one screen, so why bother? I'm just going to create a DB manager, so as you, as you found out, the manager is a keyword here. Um, and the DB manager is going to communicate with the SQLite database that they have. Um, so yeah, no need to put that in an application because I just need that in one activity. That's cool. And then there is a new hire, Mary. Uh, Mary has a lot of knowledge on Android, and she, when she looks at the code base, she's like, oh my god, this is terrible. Like, we don't do that now in 2015. We use libraries. We have a lot of stuff that actually do the, the work for us, so why bother like actually implementing a, a whole API, API can, uh, communication by ourselves or a uh, JSON parser or whatever, like that, that all stuff out there. So she looks at the code base and she's like, hmm, I'm just going to start by adding retrofit because retrofit is cool. It's just like doing all the network uh, job for me. I'm going to add OKHTTP OK with that. That works perfectly. It, lo it removes a lot of code in the API manager. Um, and then she's asked to, to start a new, a new screen. So she's going to create a new screen. She, she hates full activity, so she's going to create a fragment herself. And the fragment does everything. The activity just holding like the, the fragment is just, just a bit useless. Um, and, and she doesn't need any, any API for that. It's just like a very simple uh, screen that fetch stuff in the database and prints that on the screen. So you might be wondering, this is getting terrible, right? Um, yeah, so it's going to get even worse, actually. Um, she heard that Rx Java is awesome, so she's going to be like, huh, why not starting playing with Rx Java here? So she, she adds Rx Java uh, on top of her DB manager, while the Rx Java layer is just on uh, her aspect of, of the DB manager. Uh, like the, the old activity system is still plugging in the, the SQLite database. That's terrible, yeah. It's going to get worse. So um, John and Mary are 
a happy team uh, with our app. The app communicates with the API, communicates with the SQL, SQLite database um, until, oh my god, there is a crash. And we have no idea where it's coming from because, well, we haven't worked together and the crash is not really helpful. It's somewhere in the wild and we're just like, okay, well, let's just live with it, right? Then there is another new hire, Francis. Um, Francis is obsessed by, t by tests. He really he loves tests. And when he looks at the code, he's like, wow, that's terrible. How did you guys live with that? Like without that, actually. Um, so he's starting to look at the code and he's gonna try to implement a few unit tests, take a few pieces of the, of the app and try to add some unit tests. But he's got no knowledge of the app, he's just coming there, well, there is no, like, there is no way to have a good coverage of the, of the app at the end. Because, well, everything is so entangled together, everything is so dependent together, and, well, he's got no knowledge of the code, so uh, that's, that's terrible. So he's gonna just um, start writing UI tests, because he's got some knowledge on that as well. Um, and, um, yeah, he's gonna try playing with that. But the problem is that the, the app is so entangled with the database with, um, with the API and some, some screens are actually working with the API that way and some other are working in another way and the same with the database. So it's just, it's just not possible. They're all flaky tests at the end because, well, things are not really uh, easy to decouple. Um, yeah, so basically he's got to very poor coverage on the UI test as well. So yeah, the, the happy team have their uh, working-ish app um, and one year later it's not better it's just bigger um, so what's wrong with that activity with that app sorry um, the first thing is that every blocks on this system are dependent so the, there is a strong dependency between um, the UI and the business logic so a lot of things actually live in the activities and the fragments and stuff and well, it's just hard to actually test that, right? And the second big thing is that it's, de like, it's dependent to the code base, uh, well, between the code base and the external libs. You have, like, for example, that uh, activity fragment that, well, activity end fragment that depends on that DP manager via RxJava, but then you have some other, uh, some other thing that don't really depend on DP manager that way. So it's just like, well, it's, it's not that great. The second thing is that it's hard to test within the, with Francis. Um, and then it's hard to maintain as a result. Let's think about another approach. It's not the best approach. I'm just telling you it's, it's a better approach for sure. Um, it's something that has been discussed um, uh, by a few blog posts by namely Fernando Serras. Um, uh, it's, uh, he's describing um, how we could implement a clean, clean architecture on, on, our, on our app. So what is the clean architecture? So clean architecture was described by Uncle Bob um, a few years ago. He wrote a, a blog post around that and he described how software systems should be. So what, what is a system here? A system is like an independent brick in your app, basically. Um, so a system should be independent of frameworks. So if I want to actually replace um, like some external framework of, on my app, I should be able to do that. It shouldn't affect anything on my app. Every brick of my, of my app should be actually testable, so via UI test, uh, unit test, sorry. And the entire system itself should be UI testable easy, easily as well. It should be actually independent of the UI, so that's actually an important thing. So if tomorrow I want to write a um, TV app, for example, and I should just be able to replace uh, the UI layer by something that is like describing my TV app, right? Then it should be independent of database and independent of external agencies. So if I swap the, for example, the caching strategy on my app, um, so if I swap the, the fact that I'm uh, caching in the database uh, with something like a memcache, for example, uh, it shouldn't change anything in the rest of my app, right? It shouldn't be like a pain to actually test uh, to move, to do that move. So, simple uh, principles. Uh, let's just try to apply that on Android. 
So let's consider a, a really, really simple problem. Um, so it's something that we have in our app. So a search screen, I'm sure you, you guys have that as well in your app. Um, you just search for a artist and then you would have like a progress loading show, showing at some point and then you would have the result showing uh, as a list there. And then when you click on a, um, an item, you would be redirected to the profile of the artist. So really simple. So um, the general architecture of what I'm going to describe is this. So I'm going to have a, the data coming from, from an API. It's not training here, it's just data. Um, then I'm going to have um, a data layer. So the data layer will be responsible for basically communicating to the, the outside world. Um, then I'm going to have a domain layer. So the domain layer is the, the brain here. It's going to be like the guy who orchestrates stuff. And then I'm going to have the, the presentation layer. The presentation layer is, is, is responsible for actually showing data on the, on the screen. So um, yeah, let's have a closer look of, at, at, at each of these layers. First, data layer. So the data layer has um, exchange data to here the API. And it should be exchanging data to the domain layer. So how does it do? Um, the main principle behind the data layer is that it should be um, like a facade between the, the business, like the business logic and the actual uh, data source. So I should be able to do that to add a data database here, and the domain layer wouldn't do anything about that. Like it would be just seamlessly working. The, the, the source could be coming from shared preferences as well, content provider, GPS location, whatever you want. But then domain layer doesn't know anything. To do that, we're using the repository pattern. So the repository pattern uh, say that uh, you're going to have like a um, entity that is going to be the, the actual facade, um, and it's going to correspond to a given model. So here, we're distributing artists. So we, it's going to be the artist repository. And the artist repository will hold a reference to the, well, we're using Retrofit here, but it could be anything that you like. Um, so Retrofit client that is going to communi communicate to the API, and then the DB client that is going to communi communicate to the SQLite database. So like, if you have a really um, clean REST API, it should be really easy to describe your repositories. Um, so in our case, it's like when you have actually like uh, artists, like you're searching for artists, you're going to have a slash artist and then blah, blah, blah. Uh, so if you're searching for event, uh, event you're going to have an event repository, like this and stuff like that. So the, the main point of the repository pattern is that it's, it's actually just describing um, your service as an interface. So you're going to have, like for example, a search artist method that is going to be describing an interface. And the cool thing is that you're going to be able to just switch implementation when you are actually, actually testing. So the repository pattern allows you to test easily your uh, external sources, basically. I'm going to go more deeply to, uh, into this actually testing aspect later. So that's it for the data layer. Then domain layer. So the domain layer is the, is the brain here. Um, it's, it's a guy who is going to say like, OK, data layer, do that. And it's going to actually also respond to um, interaction from the presentation layer. So if the user is actually clicking on um, a button, it's going to notify the domain layer, hey, I got that, do, do something. And then the domain layer is going to just query the data layer to get some data and get back to the presentation layer. Right. Yes? Is that just going to be safe? No, no, no. So if you're, no, uh, to me. For me, data is a model. The name is controller, presentation layer is the view. Not really. So it's tricky. I think it's really tricky because to me the controller has any kind of, um, I think the MVC layer would live more in, at the presentation layer itself and then you're going to have stuff happening on top of it. I don't think the MVC layer is something that is, should be corresponding to an external data to me. Uh, that's how I see the MVC, MVC pattern, sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, 
yeah, let's just chat about that after the presentation. If you want. Okay, cool. So the, the domain layer. Uh, so the domain layer um, would orchestrate the, the, the flow of the data. So it, it's the guy who's going like, to tell the data layer. It's just like, yeah, let's just do this. And it's going to be described as use cases. So for example, in our um, search screen, we're going to have a search use case, which is going to be communicating to the, the data layer itself. Um, and then for each screen, you're going to have different use cases for them. Um, yeah, and then it's offering its service to the presentation layer. And the most important thing here is that it should be a pure Java module, so that it's unit testable. Um, it shouldn't have any Android UI dependency, and actually any Android dependencies. It should be just something that is um, like Java code. Um, and then it should it shouldn't have any dependency to external source, as we saw like uh, with the data layer. The data layer should be responsible to do that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's it for the domain layer, and to finish the presentation layer. So the the, the main problem that we find usually when you start on um, developing Android apps is this. Um, what is an activity? So actually, usually when you start developing on, on Android, you're like, huh, you're, um, you're going to take an MVC approach and because, well, that's what happens in a lot of systems out, out there, right? So what's, that's usually what you've been teaching or stuff like that. So you're trying to apply, uh, apply the, the, the MVC uh, pattern here. But what is an activity? Is it a view? Is it a controller? Which is terrible, right? Um, so, yeah, so that's not really what we want, right? Like, you can't test an activity. You, like, if you have, like, everything in your activity, you're going to end up, like, having a thousand lines of code. I've seen that. Like, it's horrible. It's just horrible. So, yeah, the problem of an activity is that it's tied to, to a view, the view lifecycle, so it's got this set content view thing, uh, but then it's got, it's, it's um, receiving user inputs, um, so um, it's going to have, like, for example, uh, all this on pause on resume will be event that is actually happening due to the the, the user um, using your your app. And yeah, something that I wanted to put there, but it's not really related. I, I really hate that guy, like the list activity there. That's that's the worst guy. Like it's like I'm a controller, but I'm a list as well. So hey, so yeah, just it's just even like an even more complex thing that looks convenient to you, but it's just actually adding too much boilerplate thing. And you should be able to just create a list and bind stuff to it, I think. So as a result, your very first Android activity will be just huge and testable. Uh, I'm sure of that. <laughs> I've experienced that. I'm not talking about other people, right? Um, cool. So let's take a look at our presentation layer. So Presentation layer receive interaction from the user, so it's going to be clicks, it's going to be scrolls, it's going to be swipe, whatever you want, and then it's going to change data to with the domain layer. Um, the problematic thing usually is that you see your presentation layer as a view or like something that is visible, so it's that's what blocks you to actually write good tests around that. Um, so if you just take away the view thing, like let's just think about it like it's just Java, it's just Java object that is receiving interaction and interaction is just like some piece of data basically, right? Um, so at SunGig we're using the MVP pattern. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's the best thing. I know that MVVM is great as well. Like you've got different approach to solve the same problem. But here we're using yeah MVP, so we we're gonna have a presenter that is gonna uh, be a pure Java object, um, communicating with the with the view. When I say view, it's actually a like not an Android view, just describe your view as an interface itself. And then the presenter will uh, well hold models and communicate to the 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 domain layer. So I should be able to just describe my presentation la layer like that, right? I should be able to have just a um, interface on my search presenter that would be able to do search artist, respond to that, to click on an artist, and the search view should be able to show a progress bar somewhere, hide the progress bar, and show a given list of artists if, if, it, if it has that. Um, yeah, something that we... Um, Something that we took into account at Songkick is because 
of a past previous experience where I saw like having I had like a, that huge model. So I'm, maybe you know about that, like having a huge model due to the fact that your API is giving you all these uh, fancy attributes that you don't really need for your use cases. And you're gonna end up having these huge models and try to actually like carry the, them around to bind the data. And somewhere you're gonna like, when you actually bind the view in the list view, you're gonna have like um, all this fancy logic to actually um, decide what, what you actually want to, to show to the user. Uh, so for example, I don't know, um, I, I don't have any fancy. Uh, yeah, for example, you have a list, like you have a post on, I don't know, Facebook that has a, uh, you have the model describing a post and then that post has uh, a list of attachments, but you only want to show the first two attachments, so you're gonna carry around like all the list of attachments and then you're, gonna, you're not gonna actually use all of them, so it doesn't really make sense, right? Um, so, something that we uh, took into account is that we want to just have uh, models that are minimal. So, in our case, what we actually want here, we don't really need everything in there. Like, well, it's, it's not a great example. Yeah, we could have something like even bigger, right? So, we could have like, yeah, we, we just need the display name here, and we just need maybe to show a on tour label, label somewhere um, on, on the row. So basically, these things, we don't need that. And do we actually need a local date here? No, we just need a Boolean, right? We just need to know if the guy is on tour or not, right? So we could just simplify that to having just a uh, string name and a Boolean is on tour or not. Um, and that simplifies a lot of things. Like, well, this example, again, like really simple example, but you could have something that is super, super complicated and then you're doing that every time your view is recycling and just terrible, that should just live before you're actually displaying data to the, to the screen. And then whenever you want to actually bind that view model, it's just, it should be just simple, like you should just do a set text here, it should just be doing a set visibility based on the, the Boolean, and it shouldn't be more complicated than that. And you could even use data binding if you, if you fancy that. It should even like remove all of that boiled black code. So if we get back to our uh, presentation layer uh, description, we should have like, um, we should just carry around view models um, and that's all the, the, the presentation layer has to do, deal with. So now what about fragments and activities? Um, so like this search view is an interface, so anything that could be able to display um, the progress um, or show a list of artists could implement that, right? So like in this example, I'm gonna use a fragment, but I could use something else. I could use an activity, I could use a custom view if I want. Um, and basically this guy is gonna re be responsible to show the progress bar, to hide the progress bar, to show the list of artists in the list view or the recycler view that you're using. And then that view is gonna have a reference to the presenter so that it can just forward all the uh, external events to the presenter. So the, the view is just a dumb thing. It's just like follow, forwarding stuff and yeah, doing view stuff basically. Um, so yeah, um, and then yeah, the, pr the presenter after that is just gonna do the job by communicating to the actual bus like business logic with the data layer, the, the domain layer, sorry. Domain layers. Okay, so that's our stack. Um, in terms of uh, communication between all of these uh, layers, we're using um, Oryx Java. Uh, I'm not sure if you, how many of you actually know about Oryx Java in the room? Okay, that's not bad actually. I can, well, for those who don't know about Oryx Java, you should actually have a look, like it's solving a lot of issues. Uh, it's actually creating new ones as well, but it's solving a lot of issues on Android. Um, and the cool thing is here is that, well, actually, I'm just gonna describe in a few minutes what is Oryx, it's gonna be a very terrible challenge, but um, yeah. So basically, see Oryx Java as, uh, like you have observable and an observable will emit data. Uh, and then you can, well, you're gonna subscribe to that observable and then it's gonna emit data. And then that subscriber will receive that data until it's complete or until you have an error. So just see that way and here in our uh, stack, you could have the data layer that would be just emitting like 
uh, models, and then the domain layer would uh, emit a few models, and then the presentation layer is the dumb one in the story, it's just subscribing to that and getting the view models binding that. So in terms of code, that's what it would look like. You would have um, um, this, a search method in the artist repository that would return an observable of list of artists. Um, the um, cool thing about stuff like Retrofit or stuff like that, they already have RxJava support, so you can really easily forward stuff from, R, uh, from Retrofit to your repository. Um, yeah, and then after that you would have the domain layer, which would have a use case itself. So the use, the use case would have a subscribe and an unsubscribe, and in the subscribe it would take a subscriber that would actually like seamlessly subscribe to the uh, observable that it has. Um, here I'm just using a fancy generic thing because the theoretically the use case shouldn't know anything about view models. It should be just emitting view models so that the, the the presentation layer doesn't do any kind of logic, but like what we do is we have a final converter that converts model to view model so that we actually like, well the, the use case would use a converter but we wouldn't know that it's converting to these kind of, of, of view models. Um, and finally the presentation layer would do the subscription and unsubscription, so it would um, like when you click on search or something like that, it would forward to the presenter and the presenter would do, um, via the search artist, would like ping the, the use case by subscribing and then when you actually destroy the, the view, the view will forward that to the presenter and then the presenter will unsubscribe that to the use case. And that's it. Easy, right? <laughs> so, in terms of structure, we're using Dagger. Um, Again, I hope you guys know about Dagger. How many people here use Dagger? Oh, same hands, apparently. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Dagger is, is a great way of, of, of actually putting structure in your app. It's, it can be really messy as well if you don't do it correctly, but it could be like really, really strong if you do it like really cleanly. Um, the idea behind Tiger is that it's well, it's a framework that is depends dependency injection framework. Um, it's it's got graph of modules, and each module is going to be uh, providing um, stuff. And a graph is like a scope, so it's going to be uh, linked to some kind of inner concept in your application. And then you could have like some depend dependency between graphs as well. There is Dagger 1, Dagger 2. Dagger 1 was developed by Square, and then Dagger 2 was, was a fork by Google. Um, some people are saying that it was a back fork, but yeah. Um, the, just remember that Dagger 2, like for now, we just assume that the only difference is that it's, uh, we don't talk about graph, we talk about component, but it's much more than that. All right, so um, what we have in, in um, Songkick, we, we're using an application component, so um, the component would be like the, the graph that is actually linked to your application um, and then we would, uh, in this application component, we would have uh, application related modules, so stuff like retro repositories, we don't want to create them for like each, uh, each activity, so you're going to have um, repositories for your, that are unique for your actually actual application. Um, but you could have much more than that. For example, repositories would need, for example, a, a network client. So you would have a network module that would be providing all the network related stuff um, and so on. Um, and then after that, we would have the activity component. And the activity component is the one that is unique for your given activity. So in there, we're going to have activity modules, uh, which kind of provide activity. and. Um, so we try to have another component uh, at the beginning, like for stuff like uh, fragment or custom view, uh, but it was just a mess. So at the end, we just ended up having uh, the the same component for uh, fragments or custom views. So you're gonna have uh, so for each, let's say fragment, you're gonna have um, uh, modules that are gonna be f um, providing presenters and use cases for that given fragment. So the cool thing about that is that you're actually isolating stuff. So you're actually saying like for my application, I'm gonna need 
repositories for my activity I'm going to need uh, well, an activity and then for my fragment I'm going to need something that is describing my UI so like a presenter and a use case that is going to be unique for my given um, fragment. Um, it might, might look a bit messy but you're going to see all the value when we come to actually test that. Um, another thing about structure. Um, so that's something that you may have noticed so far. I haven't used a lot of implementation to actually describe my architecture. I think that when, you, when it comes to actually describing your um, architecture, you shouldn't be showing implementation. You, sh you should actually show like the method description and what it returns and stuff like that. It should be much like really enough to actually understand what the thing actually does. Um, the good thing about only using interfaces, well, obviously I have to implement that at some point, right? But like, just to describe your implementation, the only the good thing about using in interfaces is that it actually decouples the client from the implementation. So if we take, for example, our um, presenter, um, the presenter would have a reference to the view, which is uh, an interface view uh, that will describe, like, um, I don't know, um, like whatever I said before, <laughs> like the the click and the yeah, and this thing like that. Um, and then, yeah, and then you could actually swap that implementation by something, le something else, right? Um, so the second thing is that it, like, I like that. It defines the vocabulary of the collaboration. So the repository uh, would, um, for example, emit an observable lot of um, list of artists, like list of artists. So okay, so the repository is talking this way, so this is what we are actually dealing with, the list of artists. We don't really need to know what's happening under the hood, it's actually just that vocabulary. And the third thing is that it's easy to test. So, for example, my repository, uh, it's got this, uh, it's able to search for artists, but what's happening underneath it, I don't really need to know it when it comes to tests. Like, the cool thing is that I can just replace my search repository implementation by a test implementation, and the rest of the system would just work, right? So, yeah, so let's just talk about testing now. So, this is our stack again. So on the data layer, we're gonna have like an artist repository, domain layer, we're gonna have a, a search use case, and on the presentation layer, we're gonna have a presenter and a view, which is gonna be in our case, a fragment. Um, the cool thing about all of that is that most of it is just Java, right? Um, so, like this is just like, this should be testable without trouble entry. It should be just Java things. Well, the main problem is that uh, Android has some uh, weirdness around um, like stuff that shouldn't be really part of uh, the Android implementation. So in some cases you might need a robotic trick, but most of the case you would have like really like pure j unit tests for each of these components. And the last guy, well, the, fa the fragment was still talking about something that has a life cycle and so that, so you, you, you're gonna need RoboElectric. But it's not that bad, right? Like, if I come back to um, John Mary and Francis' system, you wouldn't be able to uh, do that kind of graph here. In terms of UI testing, this is the best. Like, I really love that part. I could just, as uh, it's not about the animation, but I should just like swap that API thing by something that is like a JSON local file, and it's just gonna seamlessly work on the on the rest of, of my app. Obviously, you're gonna say like, well, it's not end-to-end -end testing, blah, 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 yeah. What if I just want to test my UI if it reacts correctly? If I if I really want to um, to test like a bad network connection, connection, I could just delay the response on my data layer side and the rest the rest of it should just like show the data accordingly, right? So yeah, that's what we just do. So uh, at Sangi, we're just mocking the data layer and actually testing the, the rest of it. Uh, it's, it's adding a lot of value. So yeah, that's how it would look like. You would have like a test implementation uh, for the given repository and that guy, instead of having a um, retrofit client in our case, we would have like a JSON loader and the JSON loader would, would load the, 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 the specific file from, from the assets folder, for example. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm a bit ahead of schedule, but yeah, let's go. Cool. As a conclusion, um, so 
whatever I describe here in terms of architecture, like as you say, like it's just MVC. Well, um, I'm. <laughs> it's not. Um, yeah, basically, I'm not saying do that architecture. I'm just saying choose a, the architecture that is right for your system. Maybe you have something that is not that doesn't fit that kind of architecture. Maybe you have something that wouldn't really work with that. But like the most important point is to actually choose an architecture and just stick with it. Like what um, uh, which, um, Mary did in our example was pretty bad because even if maybe she did something that made sense for the feature she was building, the, um, the, the entire code base thing was not going the right direction, right? One part of the app was doing things and the other one was doing something else. Basically, you have an architecture that doesn't, doesn't make sense. And if you have a new guy in the team, it just come in that system, it's just like, what is this mess? Like, there is no common architecture there. Um, that's what you code. I'm not gonna talk more about that, like, but yeah, it just makes sense to me. If you start writing unit tests on your app uh, six months after you implemented it, it's, there's a problem there. Um, and finish, like, always do what's best for the code base, not what's best for you, or what be what's best for the, what you're, you're implementing. So in our case, like, if you want to learn Rx Java, try to take a, uh, um, take an, like, an overall approach and not just, like, start on the screen and if it doesn't work well, that's fine. We'll come back in six months and we'll just like fix that. But because at some point you could have like four ways of doing threading in your app, it's just terrible. Um, yeah, so that's me. I had a slide for that. If you fancy moving to London and write with this kind of architecture, uh, just come, we're hiring. Um, links, uh, the main link here is the one from Fernando Sierra has like really go there. It's got even the GitHub repo about clean architecture and how we implemented that. Um, don't worry about taking a photo on that. I'm gonna post that to my uh, tw Twitter account. You, you're gonna be able to actually click on the link. Um, and yeah, any question? First of all, great talk, yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned um, in the beginning that um, you would like to keep your domain layer clean of any dependencies, but then you uh, basically pulled in Rx at a very low level. That's, so yeah, that's, that's something that I, I, I was sure. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem with stuff like, um, yeah, I really love Rx, I really love Dagger. But the main problem with them is that you're actually tied to them when you actually use them. That's the problem, yeah, that's the right thing. Um, we were talking about that actually uh, earlier today. The, the, yeah, I th like what we came up with is that the fact that Java is not a functional language and whatever you're gonna actually try to hide the Oric Java array, you're just gonna have to live with the fact that Java is not functional so you, you're not gonna be able to abstract that, right? Um, such different principle that you can't really do it. I hope we're gonna move to, I don't know, something a bit more functional at some point, whatever it is, um, which, yeah, <laughs> would solve a few issues, I think, that, so. Yeah. Uh, RPL, RPL with a R, yeah. You can just search for main PL, you'll find me, I think. Don't go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, we are using the same architectures, and um, I have one problem with uh, if I need to actually do login, so it's an action from the app to the server, yeah. and I don't, I don't want to use the repository because for me I can get information from the repository, but I can't send information. Like login shouldn't be in the repository. So um, how do you handle this? Because I don't have. I don't see the problem with that. Why, why wouldn't it be in the repository? Actually? I don't know, because I, I don't want to do like repository.login in my uh, domain model. So it's, it's not really something you get, it's something you want to ask to your 
server. It's yeah, but you still care about the result of your response, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. But mm -hmm. do you have like another object you need to use or? I, I think I, as a general rule, I'm just hiding everything behind the repository so that I can, I, I shouldn't really care about what, uh, what is actually going on when, when it comes to UI testing on there. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have a question about uh, keep domain model and uh, and views uh, completely separate from uh, from Android uh, um, framework. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with parsable with parsables? Because this way you introduce Android everywhere. Yeah. So um, yes. So what I would do is that you well there is a nice library which is called Parseler. Um, it's actually um, encapsulating stuff and keeping parcelable things away from your actual model that you're using. Um, so you would annotate add parcel on your uh, like artist model, for example, and then whenever you want to unwrap or wrap that, you would actually just do that seamlessly and your model wouldn't have any dependency on the parcel parcelable thing. Any other question? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.